Hello, AO Nation. It's Greg Yamico here, back with you. Uh, I have a company called Efficience. It's a software development company. We do a lot of mobile app, e-commerce, SaaS app applications, and also have a history with, uh, with investments. We had uh, two firms now that are multi-million dollar firms that were EO qualifying firms from uh, over my career. And uh, excited to be here with you again to share and talk about my experiences along with answering some questions. So I, uh, from previous conversations, I, I gave a lot of background. So I'm just gonna jump into the questions at, at this time. Okay, first question is from uh, Jazeline and she asked, Let's see, I have been stuck with writing an about me section for my website. This is the only thing that's missing and preventing me from publishing my site. Do you think one is needed or focus on the about us as, uh, as in what my business is doing for you? Also, do you recommend someone who can write, help in writing one or oversee what I have so far? My business is in social media, marketing, and branding. Any key points that I should include would, would be help. Uh, would help as well. Thank you in advance. Okay, so yes, it, um, it's, uh, the thing about this is that it's very, the about me section is really important because it's a trust builder, okay? And my SaaS coach, Dan Martell, did a study of like hundreds, if not, I think a couple thousand sites. And with that, they found like five key areas that you would wanna have. Uh, listed in your tabs up at the top of any given site or any successful site that they found and in that the uh, about us or about me section was was very uh, uh, was one of them so you want to have that in there because you want to have the ability to build trust and credibility and you want to have things in there that's going to allow that to happen whether it be uh, feedback from clients testimonials and so forth that gives rise to um, what you do and how you do it. So I would say that um, I, there's different uh, areas on the internet that you can find writers. I've got a guy that I found through a, through a, a, some mutual connections that does some writing for me. So I just email him and engage him on a specific task. He gives me a price and I, I approve and then we move forward. So that writing thing is always, it can be challenging for people that don't have that background or don't have their brain doesn't work that way, which it definitely doesn't work that way for me. So there's uh, something I saw out there like innovativeinc.ca was, uh, was a site that I ran across recently that helps people. You know, you got, like, you got sites like 99designs that does this type of work for design, uh, design people and so forth and you may be familiar with that there's other sites out there for writing and there's a lot of these people that are like stay-at-home moms or others that just do contract work that work very cost effectively and are very good writers so finding somebody that works in your space would be advised who has some familiarity with sites that do the type of work you do if you can find that but general writing they do what they will do is they'll go research the heck out of things read a lot of stuff and they'll be able to create the content that's just like wow they know more about my business than i do so i would um i would definitely engage and 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 uh look at those options so good luck with that next question is from michelle Michelle asked, uh, let's see, she asked, I'm expanding my company into remodeling and residential construction. I am looking to hire someone to oversee the subcontractors that will be doing the actual work. I am trying to figure out the best pay scale for this person. I was thinking it would be best to pay this person on a per job basis. Would it be better to pay them per hour, a certain dollar amount per job, or a percentage of the job? So, very good questions and and this is kind of a quandary that we all struggle with because in reality it comes down to the particular factors of the, the situation on a case-by-case -case basis like what is the person that you have working for working with you right now what are they like what are they about do they do they show a lot of um initiative are they uh good at keeping the keeping things going that they, they, they do more work than you know than the time allowed and so forth they really push hard to make things happen if you have that type of person who is wanting to succeed excel then i would suggest 
um, I would suggest paying them by uh, percentage of the job because they're going to make more money that way and they're going to be motivated to get it done and to make things happen. So if you have that normal person who just wants to work the you know, the eight to five job and be there and not think about work afterwards and so forth and it's just my wants to put in their hours I would I would look at that paying that person differently so it's it's um, it's advantageous to do work where you're always motivating I've always looked at my world and the businesses I've been in and the people I've been around of trying to motivate them with either equity or a percentage of work and, and pay that was beneficial for the um, uh, getting it done and being invested in it and it, treating it like it's their own deal. Whenever you can treat, uh, have somebody treat the work like it's their own business, you're going to get more out of them. They're going to put more of their mindset and, and things are going to be better and everybody's going to make more money because of that. So sharing some of the, uh, of the revenue, the profits of a particular job is very attractive to me, but it hasn't worked in the past for me if it's the wrong person. So I would, um, from my experience, I would definitely consider it and, and try out some, you know, certain things with certain people and see what works. If it doesn't, change it up. Next question. Uh, Flora Sage asked, Are you, as you reach new levels in your business, how did you begin to show up differently? Meaning, how did you approach scheduling your day, working with your team, decision making, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And then they uh, also ask, we are, we all, we all hear advice to quote, show up as if you were a $500,000 a year coach or quote, make decisions as if you were already making 1 million a year in your business, unquote. So what did that look like for you in real time? Okay. First question then, uh, talking about how did it begin to show up differently for me is that as my businesses grew, uh, things get more complicated and the exchange of, of uh, conversation communication changes okay there's a lot of there's a lot of things that, that can get lost and and assumptions made people thinking that this is, needs to be done or has been done and not and so on and so forth or thinking that it's somebody else's role to play or somebody else's job to do it's not my worry so to prevent that from happening, as you grow from two or three people in a business up to five to eight, to 10 to 12, then what you need to do is implement certain processes. Okay. And that's what I've done is I implemented certain processes, certain operating. I talked about this in my last coaching call about having an opera business operating system and a popular one out there is Rockefeller habits or scaling up. And another one is the EOS system. So Rockefeller Habits was attractive because it, it put in place certain uh, format that you would follow, like you would have a daily huddle that you, you would get everybody together and, and in, in a room if, if need, I mean, if you have that situation or if not, you can do it virtually. You can do it over the phone or over Zoom or something like that. But the point is that for a short period of time, usually you're standing up. You don't want people sitting down. It's not there that you're going to carry on for 30 minutes to an hour. You're going to come together for 8 minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, something like that. And you can start the meeting at an odd hour, like at uh, you know 9.08 in the morning or 11.12, something like that, or 11.11. Something where people know that this is important, that it's going to start at that time. And if they're not there, they're not going to be a part of it then it's going to um, it's going to end at a certain time or right about that time and with that you have the process that you get everybody aligned you talk about what are your the key things to do in a huddle or talking about what what have people done and where are they stuck and what you need to do to get people unstuck who needs to talk who needs to interact who needs to meet after that meeting to push forward on that you don't want to solve all the problems there you want to get them aligned you want to get them to hook up afterwards or schedule a meeting that's going to solve that problem with the right the right people on board. So you don't want to take everybody's time. You know, I've seen huddles that are 50 to 80 people, I've seen huddles that are, are 3 to 5 to, to, to 10, depending on the size of the company. So I've seen, and, and usually they'll have things up on the wall or they'll do, a, uh, they'll do something up on a screen and you'll follow the format. And you can put things up on there, and sometimes they'll have them digitized so that you can go back to, to see what's going on with it, 
these things. This is a very important aspect to running a business. So there you start with the huddle, then you have that weekly meeting, then you can have, you have the monthly meeting, you have the quarterly and the annual, and that all works towards planning and getting towards a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. So uh, again, an operating system for business is huge into having alignment and getting, having that communication. So for the next question, that Flora asked, uh, we are here, we all hear advice like show up as if you're 500,000 a year coach or make decisions if you're already making 1 million a year in your business. Um, I've heard things around this. I'm not sure uh, I've got the exact context of what you're talking about, but I'll just take it from what my assumptions are here. Uh, was it, and they're asking, what does it look like for you in real time? Uh, you want to show up, you want your business to run as smoothly and as efficiently as possible, okay? And you want to think about your business in a way is that you're scaling it and you're, and you're working towards bigger goals, bigger objectives. And a lot of times people run business with a mindset that is down here and prevents them from getting up here. So I think this question is kind of around that, like make sure you're running your business at a higher level. And if you do run at a higher level, you're going to you're going to more easily get to that higher level. So I would go ahead and look at some of these operating systems because if you're using those operating systems, those systems ha are are able to handle businesses that are that are million dollar businesses, five million dollar business, fifty million dollars dollar businesses, and bigger. So utilizing operating systems, utilizing uh, the ways to communicate, they help get you there. And having the mindset that you are operating at a higher level, it's going to be very beneficial to not prevent yourself or hold yourself back in some way. Next question. Uh, this is Flora also asked, um, what percentage of your mindset would you attribute, uh, percentage of your success would you attribute to the following? One, mindset, two, strategy, three, connections, four, other things. Well, as I was just saying in the previous, this kind of is a good, good flow into this because uh, Flora, this is, Mindset is hugely important, is number one, okay? Because what so many of us don't realize is that as we struggle and fight through the um, our business world and we run into all these roadblocks and headways and things are, are very um, difficult, it is in that we all talk about our successes and how we had to struggle and how we had to push through them all. That's all great, but a lot of that trouble and a lot of that difficulty comes from our mindset. Okay, if we place too much importance on something, the universe seems to uh, come back to us. And if we are driving and pushing too hard, there's kind of a counterbalancing aspect of the world that causes it to be tougher for you. And you know, like when you're think about the, the time when you're rushing to get somewhere, when you're rushing, I got to get here, I got to go, and you're placing a lot of importance on that. What normally happens? You get more red lights. Okay, you get uh, you run into traffic. Uh, the train comes by and stops you. So whenever you're placing so much importance on it, things kind of uh, work against you. And so one lowering importance and making sure your mindset is is in a, a way that allows for you to be opened up to um, making your mind or opening your mind to a level that is achieving success that's not holding you back. A lot of people. Um, say like, okay, well, if, they, if I just made a hundred thousand dollars a year, then everything would be great, and so on and so forth. And they get to a hundred thousand dollars a year, and then when they want to go more, their mindset is still stuck at a hundred thousand dollars a year, and they they have a hard time getting past that. So the mind will hold us to a certain place, and our consciousness when we grow up, we may think of things in a scarcity mindset, we may think of things in a limited mindset that is always. A, causing us to push harder and not getting to more of an abundant mindset. So there's a lot of coaches out there um, that help in this. Uh, Peter Sage is somebody I work with to help open me up to a lot of more abundant thinking. I think I limited myself in my earlier part of the career and had a lot of struggles because of limited mindset. So, so to, to, to zero in on your question, mindset is number one. Strategy and the things that you do are always changing. You have, want to have a plan and have a strategy, but then it always changes. Okay, so it's there. It's helpful for you to set a direction for yourself and start heading off into a path. But then the world and, and the universe will, will push things towards you that um, cause you to get off track. But if you do have that 
goal, that long-term big goal that you're going after. And as the world uh, continues to push things towards you that get you off track, you know that you know the goal you have, you know that you can adjust and get back on. So strategy connections are all important and things that you want to have. Um, definitely your network is very key. AO and, and so accelerators organization, entrepreneurs organization or EO, YPO, these other programs and network of people that I've met in these groups have been very helpful for me to achieve um, success in a in my accelerated approach okay it's allowed for things to happen faster it's allowed for me to gather information and not have to experience so much difficulty in my life where other people have helped me get around that difficulty or prevented me from running into that difficulty so network's also very important but as if, to your question mindset is number one and getting rid of your self-imposed limitations getting rid, rid of your ceilings and opening up to an abundance mindset is very important and one way to do that one way to have more of an abundant mindset is for being um, uh, having more gratitude in your life having more gratitude for the things that are there in your life right now and the more your mind works in a gratitude the more you open up to an abundance level of thinking next question Joe uh, Joe asked I'm getting ready to officially launch my new company Liberty Home Watch Academy I'm thinking of doing a FB Live so that everyone can hear and feel my passion that I have for this new venture. I also hope that my network will see this and can start referring people to me. Do you feel FB Live is an appropriate platform to announce my new company, or are there other better alternatives? Well, yes, it's an appropriate place to launch, but I would have low expectations because depending on things, your uh, the new company is you don't have like an attachment to this new company a lot of people know about it a lot of people are thinking about it a lot of people are wondering what you're doing a lot of people are curious about what you're doing you may have a network of friends but no interest in this new company so you can do a Facebook live it'll go out there in the world and some people may be curious and they'll see it and they'll be more aware of you going forward but as the traditional advertising model talks about people have to see things between 22 26 28 times before it starts to really sink in and so getting it out there and having that available is is great to do because you can use that over and over and it's a way for something that you want to put on your on your website so people can go look at this you talked about wanting to do this live from the, the aspect of showing um, your passion I would talk about what your core purpose as a company is because people are going to resonate with who you are and what you're about, what your core values are, what your core purpose is. And I would definitely be um, having something of a model like that or a video that could be used to you post on Facebook, have it on your uh, have it on your website and then share it periodically to the network. And the more people see it, the more they're going to resonate with who, who and what you're doing and then come back to think about you when the timing is right. Remember, there's only a limited amount. Chet Holmes talks about in his book, uh, I think it's called The Sales Marketing Machine or something like that. Uh, it's a very, very popular sales book. He talks about people that you only have like 8% of the respective audience. If you had a stadium, a big, say, football stadium, and you were going out and stood in the middle of the field and you were going to make this announcement to the 80 to 100,000 people at that stadium. You only have about 8% of those people that would be in the market. The rest may be like, like coming up or interested down the road, and the rest wouldn't care at all. It wouldn't be in the market for anything at that time. Um, it may never. So the fact is that you have that 8% you're trying to reach, and by them, and then the timing of the other ones, when the timing is right for the other ones, they're going to. They may think about you because they've seen something about you before. So putting it out there, allowing people to be have access to it, to go back and find it when it is appropriate and to keep sharing it and hitting them with it is a way to build awareness and continue to share with some type of network to get it out there. Um, you know, and using, uh, putting that video that you, cre uh, you create on LinkedIn and other social media places is, is all a way to spread the word these days and is the appropriate way to share and, and contribute messages to, e to each other. We are all watching uh, a lot more Netflix, a lot of other on-demand applications that we're not seeing advertisements, okay? 
and the big money that's being spent in those, unless you're watching the Super Bowl, the, the, the 100 million people that watch the Super Bowl, then you, they're paying big money because of, of that potential viewership and the fact that everybody is intrigued with what the new ads are because it, it's created a whole mystique around itself. That's great if you got the money. In, in our world, in small business world, you want to have the ability to share it within social media and have people find you, be able to come up. What can you do to be the number one search when people are looking for your respective business? Okay. And what would allow for getting those keywords? What would allow for you creating content that when people are typing in those keywords, they're going to find you. So we're all hearing that those are the avenues that we have to take today to attract our customers. Next question. Jason, Jason and Antonio ask, what are some great ways to reach out to potential partners on LinkedIn? Well, <laughs> great segue of uh, talking social media. Uh, he also asked, what should one structure, how sh should one structure that important first direct, how should one structure that important first direct message? Okay. So potential partners, when you say potential partners on LinkedIn, are you talking about business partners or are you talking about clients and customers that you're trying to sell to? So that's a distinction that I want to talk about. So um, I would assume you're talking about going after potential customers and, and reaching them on LinkedIn. I've used LinkedIn to connect with people and I find it to be very attractive. Depending on the respective field you are in, it is great for B2B, especially if you have a profile that is similar to the profile of people that you're after. And if not, it's fine, but making sure that your LinkedIn page is structured to talk about the things that you're going to be doing for the respective business that you go after. Uh, you adding Sales Navigator to your LinkedIn, and it costs like I don't know, 80, 90 bucks a month that they have Sales Navigator, but it's such a great tool. You can set up, go in, set up the parameters, and you can start sending out. A certain list to or a certain number of messages you can only do so many a day certain number of messages to this audience that you're going after and sharing a message to them and asking them to friend you first and then once they friend you then they and the reason why they should friend you then once they friend you then you get a follow-up message and so forth now there's different avenues of thought relative to this like is this a good way to connect with people? Should they hit them with something? If I'm connecting with somebody, are, are, is that too forward to hit them up with a sales message right afterwards? You have to determine how you feel about that and then how to structure it once you do. Okay, but it is very, um, very attractive way to connect with the right business, especially in a B2B type of environment. And I'm using it and going to be using it on some new products I'm creating. And I find that it is a way to reach people, especially if you create the message that's appropriate for what you're offering. And so you asked about that. What's, how do you structure the message? message? The message, I mean, there's no general right way that, you know, say you do this, this, and this, you're going to have a great message. It's very, I would utilize a message that is that explains exactly what you're offering to somebody in a very polite appropriate way that gets them gets their attention okay so if you're thinking about your space and what you're in you're gonna say um, uh, you know if I'm selling like uh, sunglasses to somebody okay that is something that I'm not going to use LinkedIn for but uh, just first thing popped in my head and if you're selling sunglasses to somebody you want to resonate with a message that talks about these sunglasses we have half off of major brand sunglasses we have the best brands um, that and access to them that nobody else has so what are the key things that are going to grab somebody's attention is it if if anybody else can sell sunglasses what are you doing differently that's going to capture somebody's attention and then structure that in a very clear concise short message you don't want long messages so how do you structure the message or how, how, you ask make sure it's short and to the point and resonate and has the ability to resonate with the, your target audience who is that audience you're going after and when you as a, uh, maybe sampling some of your tar target audience with uh, this message uh, friends that are your target audience or existing clients that are your target audience run the message by them and say if I if I sent you that would that resonate with you would you be more open to um, hearing more about 
what was involved with those first lines in that message. So that's just a couple of ideas for you that you can you can uh, try out for yourself. Nathan Peterson asks, um, have two separate questions. One, we are a B2B company and our goal is to get in touch with people in HR who are also decision makers. What is the best way to get connected and stand out from others outside of cold calling emailing? Two, what is the proper amount of time to follow up with both cold and warm prospects? Okay, well, I just talked about it, Nathan. So I used this question after that one because um, if B2B communication, I think LinkedIn is one of the best. It, it, it may not be the best depending on your respective business, okay? But I think it's one of the best for a lot of businesses. And depending on what you're doing, then I would, um, you know, you're getting in touch with HR people. I think be, I think LinkedIn is going to be a great one. Facebook is uh, a little, I mean, it's more retail for uh, probably younger crowd. LinkedIn is for the age and for the type of person you're going after. I wish you, I would use LinkedIn. And again, structure like I talked about in the previous question, and go after uh, them with the uh, all the things I said before. There's really nothing else to I mean to add to that. Uh, instead of um, what are some of the best ways to connect and stand out from others is is uh, LinkedIn. And then once you build the LinkedIn network and connections, they the LinkedIn messaging. Not all people are going to read their LinkedIn messaging, so you could follow up with those people with emails. I would look at um, look at that as approach of building that segment and then you can pull out emails from the LinkedIn gathering that you have. Um, if you're not familiar with this too, let me add that there are companies out there that will do this for you. That you pay them like um, some thousand to fifteen hundred dollars and they'll set up your campaign, they'll set up your uh, your, your messaging for you and they'll set up the, the, the they'll zero in on a target do the research on on your target find out how many people out there are making up your target and then start the messaging process and then the follow-up and like and it's up to you and them to talk about how often you follow up with them and sometimes it's like once you get the friend once you once you ask them to be part of your network it may want to wait three days five days some people do it immediately once they get accepted within like 24 hours they're, they're hit the, the sales message that may not be the way you want to structure it, or it could be, and it works. You know, both ways work, but uh, certain fields may have a preference to be more considerate of making sure that they are getting comfortable with their network and getting their people comfortable with them before they start hitting them with a sales message. Um, what's the proper amount of time to follow up with both cold and warm prospects? Uh, there's not any standard time, okay? Uh, a lot of people feel that if you call them within uh, three days from when you initially send a message to them, that that would be appropriate time frame. If you don't get a response from an email uh, or a cold call, to follow up in three days. Okay, I've heard stories of great salespeople that call the same person every day for a month and a half. Finally, got the person on the phone and sold the biggest case in his career. So that was a story of one of the sales gurus of, of the past, and I can't remember specifically which one it was, but it's it's so, it's not to say that there's some particular uh, amount of time you should, you should, add, you should wait to respond or, or follow up with people. Uh, it's just what you're comfortable with and without waiting too long. You don't want them to forget about the message. So if you email them, I'd give it a, uh, maybe a, a two days and then follow up with a phone call. Some people will send an email and or they'll send a, they'll call and then they'll send a follow up email. So we'll have both avenues uh, or both approaches to connect with them, and then wait to see if they recall back or if they email back. A lot of people are more comfortable emailing back once they hear the email, once they get the phone call. So the dual approach can be successful depending on your network and 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 who you're talking to also. And of course, you don't want to rub people the wrong way, but. Good salespeople will have a knack of having a polite approach and message on the phone that is reaching out to them in a way that is talking about their pain points. If you make a phone call or an email and you're talking all about yourself, people are not going to respond. Okay? When you talk about something that is respective to their pain, what is the pain that they're dealing with and what is the pain that your service or product is going to solve? and you follow up discussing how you can solve their pain for them, 
you're more apt to get a follow-up response. That's whether it's LinkedIn, cold calls, emails, and so forth. So most important thing to re reaching out and communicating and connecting with our customers is to talk about their pains, not you. They don't give a heck about you. They don't care who you are. They don't care what you've done. They don't care how long you've been around. They don't want to hear all that stuff. Okay? They want to know what what's in it for me. Okay? And when you can get a message to them and talk about what's in it for them and what's their how you're solving their pain point, you are more apt to have communication with these people. Okay? Um, when I had people LinkedIn send me a LinkedIn message and say, um, you have a software company and we work specifically with software companies and we solve these key areas and so forth. And I was like, I have those pains. I have those problems and they solve them. Maybe I should talk to them. So any messaging that any of you do out there, right, whether it's Nathan or any of the rest of you, please do yourself a favor and structure your messaging around taking care of people's pains and problems. You're going to get more business that way, and, and they're going to be more res, uh, respective and receptive of communicating with you by doing so. That is all the question I have for today. Good being with you. Um, AO Nation is awesome. Lots of great things are happening out there. Sh Sean is driving a great community of people. And if you put in, if it, it, we say this in EO a lot, you know, what, what you put in is what you're going to get out. So if you utilize the mentors, you utilize and put questions out there and, and, and work with the network, you're going to benefit a lot more than if you just sign up and say, okay, well, I've signed up, so now where's, where's the win for me? What you put in is what you'll get out. Put in the time, put in the networking with people. That's going to be a huge opportunity for you to advance your business and advance your, even your personal life by being exposed to a great network like this. Greg D'Amico with Efficiency. Talk to you next time. Take care.